So my name is Kirsten Bayer and I'm with the Illinois Center for Specialized Professional Support at Illinois State University um, in Bloomington Normal, Illinois. And we um, host and work on the Autism Training and Technical Assistance Project. Um, so we welcome you and thank you for joining us. Today's topic, a monthly webinar for July is Sexuality and the Spectrum, Lessons on Sex, Dating and Love, Autism Style. And we are excited to welcome back Amy Gravino. She's done a session for us in the past this year, um, which I'm happy to share out if you're interested in that as well towards the end of the session. But before we start with Amy, just a couple of housekeeping items. So we are on the Zoom webinar platform. So this is more of a presentation style platform. It also allows for us to have bigger audiences than a regular Zoom meeting. So what that means is that as an attendee, you cannot unmute yourself and you cannot turn on your camera. So it doesn't really uh, allow for that high level of interaction, which we're sad about, but we do encourage interaction and participation in the chat. Um, or the Q&A, you can ask questions, or if you do have uh, a question that you would like to have live or um, that you would like to ask Amy live, you can raise your virtual hand um, and then I can unmute you towards the end of the session and you can have that dialogue. So it's just more of like, I control your microphone. Um, so we're happy to do that and have that open discussion um, for you all towards the end of the session. Um, I just went ahead and made sure that everyone can participate in the chat. So you should be able to type in there now if you weren't able to before. Um, another housekeeping item is that this is being recorded and we will have this recording up on our website. So if you have a colleague who registered but wasn't able to join today or an administrator or somebody else, a CBO that you would like to forward this session along to, um, we would really appreciate it. And I will put our website in the chat towards the end of the session. The recording typically comes on our website within about 24 to 48 working business hours. Depends how long it takes me to edit the closed captioning for you all. And then speaking of that, we do have closed captioning on for note-taking purposes or um, just for accessibility reasons as well. We want to make sure we have that on. So feel free to turn that on as well. Um, again, so my name is Kirsten Bayer. If you have a question during today's session, you can feel free to reach out to me via the chat. Um, I'm on here the whole time with Amy, or you can feel free to email me or uh, call me as well if you have a follow-up question. And uh, just a little bit about our project before I hand it off to the presenter today. So if you're not familiar with the Autism Training and Technical Assistance Project, um, we are ADA, and it, we develop and present resources that assist individuals with autism or autistic individuals in their transition from secondary education to post-secondary or to employment. So we are a very niche grant um, project. We focus specifically on the transitional piece and supports um, and resources for all of you to support your students, your children, um, being a community member to support the autism community. Um, with that transitional piece. And then our center, the Illinois Center for Specialized Professional Support is who uh, facilitates and works on the project. So we are partnered and funded by ISB or the Illinois State Board of Education. Um, so our center, ADA is one of our uh, near and dear to our hearts projects. Um, but we overall as a center create and support and develop professional development for education professionals across Illinois. Um, we provide technical assistance, we develop publications and resources, work to facilitate program improvement strategies, and we focus specifically on college transition, recruitment, retention, and then completion um, for all students. Our center focuses on all students, but ADA is specifically for our autistic individuals or individuals with autism students. Um, and so we specifically focus a lot on special population learners, um, and we were founded in 1977. We are housed at Illinois State University, so Bloomington Normal, um, in the EAF department. So that's just a little bit about us. Here is our website up on the screen. If you would like to go to it now, you can feel free to, but I'll put a direct link in the chat here in one second. Um, again, we are funded by ISB, and here's our logo and everything too. And then just a couple of polls that I'm gonna launch here. You should be able to answer both of them at the same time. 
We would love to get to know just a little bit about you as our audience this morning. So the first question is which region of the state are you located in? So are you from Chicago area, Northeast or Northwest? Um, if you're from the central area, Southwest or Southeast? Excuse me. And then, and that's a typo on the poll. It should just say central, so not East central. I apologize for that. And then which out of stakeholder do you best represent? And that one is multiple choice. So if you are a secondary educator, but you also have a child who is an autistic individual or individual with autism, you can feel free to select multiple of those. So we'll give everyone a couple more seconds to answer these polls. Both of them are up now. We appreciate your participation. If you've ever been on an ADA webinar before, you've probably done these polls a million times, but they are great for our analytics and it helps us get to know you and helps Amy, the presenter, get to know you just a little bit so she can tailor the presentation to you all. I still see those polls trickling in. And we have so many people participating in the chat. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Okay, so I see that kind of slowing down. I'm gonna end the poll and share the results with everyone. So it looks like we have 45% uh, are joining us from Chicago um, and then a good spread across the state as well. So thank you for joining us. And then uh, what I'm really interested in is which stakeholder do you represent? So we have a lot of secondary educators with us, um, some students and young adults on here, quite a few actually, which is awesome. Um, we have some post-secondary and community members and family members. Too. We have a, every single category is selected. That's so awesome. We're so great that all of our stakeholders find this topic valuable. We're so excited for that. So I'm going to stop sharing that poll. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I will hand it off to you, Amy, to start sharing your screen. And then if anyone needs anything, I will be here. Feel free to reach out to, in the chat. Thank you so much, Kirsten. Good morning, everyone. Very happy to be here today. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Just give me one moment. Uh, okay, so let's these things at the top getting in my way. There we go. Okay. Start the slideshow. Okay. So this is sexuality and the spectrum lessons on sex, dating, and love autism style. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the show Love American Style, but there's your 1960s pop culture reference for the day, um, which is just as well fitting because most of my references don't go past 1977 anyway. Uh, very happy to be back at ATA. Uh, I had a great time presenting in February on freshman disorientation. Hopefully some of you caught that. Um, and I'm glad to be talking to you today about sexuality. So let's get into it. Um, just a brief overview of some of the topics we'll be covering in today's webinar. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction to autism and sexuality, the background, the rationale for why we need to talk about this subject, why it's so crucially important for autistic people to receive comprehensive and accurate sex education, what some of the myths and misconceptions are uh, that currently exist around autism and sexuality, and which often preclude us from having these conversations uh, about autism and sexuality, and then finally what some of the uh, consequences can be if we don't have conversations about autism and sexuality. Um, then I'll be sharing with you the first-hand perspective of a woman on the spectrum, that's me. Um, to answer your question, Jacqueline, the slides will be shared following the presentation. I'll be sending them to Kirsten so that they will be made available to you. So uh, don't worry about that all, Christy, as well. I see that was your question. So yes, those will be absolutely available. Um, following me sharing my story and some of the experiences that I've been through as a woman on the spectrum with dating and relationships, um, We'll be talking about how can teachers and professionals better address sexuality and autism. So um, I, have, I have given this presentation to a variety of audiences, and this is kind of the angle I'm coming at from here today. But I, I want to acknowledge and shout out to the students and young adults on the spectrum who might be in attendance. And I hope you'll, you'll get plenty out of this as well. Um, I, I What I didn't include in this one is my dating do's and don'ts that I sometimes put when I give this presentation exclusively to folks on the spectrum, but uh, feel free to reach out to me if you want. After this, if you have questions, you can always reach me via email. Um, so and then after that, I'll have some strategies, both for professionals and parents, for how you can open up a dialogue 
about autism and sexuality with your clients, the students you serve, or your children. Um, and I'll be talking about some of the work that I'm currently doing uh, at Rutgers University, where I work, where I'm actually developing a sex ed curriculum for individuals on the spectrum. Uh, and of course, as always, we'll have time for questions at the end. So you can use the Q&A function here in the Zoom webinar. Uh, please you know, put your questions there if you like, or you can put them in the chat. I think Kirsten's going to be monitoring both of those. We'll keep track of them. Um, and then at the end, we will uh, try to get to as many of those as we possibly can. Uh, so there we go. Okay. So I, I know I can't see, oops, it's an accident. I can't see anybody's hands. Um, normally when I give this presentation in person, I always ask people to raise their hand and you can think about it to yourself or you can put it in the chat if you want. But who do you talk to about sex and dating? Do you talk to your family? Right? Some people might be close to a sibling, you know, that they can find in about that stuff, but probably don't talk to your parents about sex and dating, right? Most of us don't. Do you talk to a therapist or a counselor? I'm from New York. Everybody has a therapist. There's no shame. You know, I know some of you are in Chicago. I'm sure plenty of people in Chicago have therapists. So that might be, uh, you know, who people would talk to about sex and dating. What about a religious leader? Probably not priest, rabbi, maybe not so much. You know, some people do premarital counseling, but by and large, that might not be the first person that someone talks to about sex and dating. What about your friends? Now, this is usually where I see all the hands uh, go up when I when I give this presentation. Um, Almost all of us rely on our friends as our social network, as the people that we talk to the most about sex and dating. Uh, this is, I think, true for, for most people, for the most part. Or do you not have anyone to talk to or don't feel comfortable talking about sex and dating? Um, I gave this presentation not too many years ago to a group of autistic college students, and almost all of them raised their hands for the last one. Uh, and, and what does that tell us, right? That you know, sexuality is such a big part of the human experience, but for so many people on the spectrum, it's viewed as taboo, it's viewed as, quote, inappropriate. Imagine not having anyone to talk to about this huge part of life just because you happen to be on the autism spectrum. This is the position that many people on the spectrum find themselves in and are ultimately not receiving support, um, you know, for trying to, you know, navigate their their sexuality and their desires and and, and wanting to be in a relationship. So that's you know, kind of sets the stage for why this is such a crucially important topic for us to discuss. Um, so a couple of those misconceptions that I mentioned, because there are quite a few of these, some of them are kind of perpetu perpetuated by the media and carried on in the portrayals of autism that we see in TV shows, but some of them are just also uh, created and carried on because of the diagnostic criteria that we use to diagnose autism. So we'll distinguish between those as well. So one of them but the, probably the biggest one is that autistic people are asexual or don't have sex. Now, off the bat, of course, there are plenty of people who do identify as asexual, and that's absolutely fine. Um, I, I will never say that there's something wrong with being asexual, totally not. But I find that this, this has kind of been perpetuated. Number one, shows like The Big Bang Theory, Shelton Cooper, who I can't stand, but I'm glad is off the air. Um, but then also, this kind of exists because of something we do that's called infantilizing people on the spectrum. And what infantilization refers to is where we talk about specifically adults on the spectrum as if they're children in big bodies, right? So you may have heard someone say, you know, he's a 25 year old with, with the mentality of a five year old. No, he's a 25 year old with the mentality of a 25 year old. He has just has his own challenges, strengths, desires, needs, and so forth. Um, so, you know, the, the actual truth is that autistic people do have sex. We have good sex, bad sex, mediocre sex, everything in between. We just may need some more explicit and specific support in achieving whatever our sexual goals may be. Um, another misconception, dating an autistic guy is exactly the same as dating an autistic girl. Now, where, where why am I putting this here? Well, this, this comes from when I think about the diagnostic criteria that were created to diagnose autism, which were created observing boys. So, we, it kind of gives us this one specific presentation of autism and causes us to paint all people on the spectrum with the same broad brush. But no two people on the spectrum are alike, certainly. And and got girls and guys on the spectrum are certainly not alike just because we share the same diagnosis. All too often, I, I, get, I know so many women on the spectrum who have left support groups because they went to these support groups and they were either ignored by the men there or they were hit on. Or, or, or there were parents who were like, oh, you're autistic too, you can date my son. It's like, whoa, that's not what I'm here for, you know? So autistic girls and women are not the same as autistic boys. Sounds basic, sounds like something we should all know, yet a lot of people still don't seem to, to fully grasp that or think that 
if you share a diagnosis with someone that you'll be best friends automatically. It's like, well, yeah, I'm autistic and he's autistic, but he's a jerk. I don't want to be friends with him. You know, but we all have different personalities, not just that we're autistic. Um, and I think that that gets kind of lost as well in some of these discussions. Um, another misconception, uh, individuals with autism are all straight, right? So historically, when we have had conversations around autism and sexuality, if we have had those conversations, they've usually been from a heteronormative perspective. Um, but there are actually more people uh, on the spectrum who identify as LGBTQ than in the neurotypical population. And so that gets us into the, the concept of intersectional identity. So meaning that it's not just that you're autistic, but you could also be autistic and gay or autistic and trans, just like you could be autistic and a person of color. Like all those identities come together to influence how someone experiences the world. And if you are someone who, who is on the spectrum and who identifies as LGBTQ, that is kind of a double whammy. And, and you, you know, you're looking for validation and acceptance both as an autistic person and someone who's LGBTQ. And those are that kind of compounds those challenges. Um, so basically any sexual orientation or gender identity that you'll see among neurotypicals, you'll see among people on the spectrum. Uh, and, and the reason for the preponderance and, and the high rates could be Many people on the spectrum don't feel a need to identify with gender norms or, or social norms, more honesty and reporting. There's there's any number of potential factors for this, but it's something we have to keep in mind when we're having these conversations. Um, another misconception, autistic people only date other autistic people. Um, Susan, thank you for that comment. So a uh, furry is actually considered, I, I believe, kind of a fetish more than a, a sexual identity, so to speak. Um, that would fall because so there's different kind of subcategories when we're talking about, uh, you know, fetishes versus kinks. And there are actually a lot of people on the spectrum who are kink positive, who are engaged in that part of the community and who also need support to navigate that because unfortunately there's a lot of abusers in the kink communities. Um, but but they, I appreciate you sharing that comment. So thank you. Thank you for doing that. And I'm glad your student felt comfortable enough to share that with you as well. That's a really powerful statement. Um, but so getting back to this misconception that autistic people only date other autistic people, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the show Love on the Spectrum. Uh, it was originally on the air in Australia, and then um, it came to Netflix here in the States. I was actually in talks with the producers to be the coach on the show because they wanted an autistic person as the coach. Ultimately, it ended up not happening because Hollywood's going to Hollywood. But um, what's interesting about the show is that all the couples on the show, either the couples that came in already as couples or the dates that were set up on the show, were either autistic person and another autistic person or autistic person and someone with another mental health diagnosis. There weren't any autistic neurotypical couples or mixed neurology couples, as I would call them. And that's not really an accurate representation of reality, right? There's plenty of people on the spectrum I know who do prefer to date someone who shares their mental health diagnosis, who understands what they're going to. There's people on the spectrum who date people with other mental health diagnoses, you know, OCD, ADHD, uh, bipolar disorder, whatever it could be. And there's autistic people who date neurotypicals. Um, so autistic people can and do date all different kinds of people. Um, for me, most men in general drive me up the wall and, and you know, most autistic guys drive me up the wall. I got that backwards. So sorry, that joke totally fell flat. That's okay. Um, so another misconception, uh, you know, and this came up when I was giving a presentation several years ago for a conference uh, in Romania of all places, someone asked me if autistic people feel rejection the same way neurotypicals do. I was kind of blown back by this. I, I, you know, and I think this kind of comes out of that diagnostic criteria that we're talking about, which often suggests that people on the spectrum don't experience empathy. Um, and the other place I think this comes from is that we think that if someone doesn't, ex doesn't express or display emotions in a way that's typically expected, that they're therefore not feeling those emotions. And that's simply not true. Um, autistic people may not, you know, it, it respond to rejection in a way that you would expect, but it doesn't mean that we don't feel it. I have a lifetime's worth of experience with rejection, and they have all hurt. They hurt no less, you know, than, I mean, the, I, I remember them, and, and the memory carries pain with it. Um, and that doesn't really go away, even though the, the actual hurt in the moment does fade over time. But no matter who you are, neurotypical or on the spectrum, rejection hurts, plain and simple. Um, and the last myth, and this is probably the one that hurts me the most, and unfortunately is still perpetuating, is that individuals with autism cannot love. Um, and just a brief note on language, you may notice throughout this presentation that I use both uh, identity first language and person first language. So person first is saying individual with autism, identity first is saying autistic person. Um, there does tend, there tends to be a large preference in the autistic community for identity first language. 
Um, unfortunately, there tend to be a lot of fights about this on social media. And in my opinion, we have much bigger issues to contend with. So I really don't care for all the unending arguments about this. So I just use both kind of interchangeably. But just to get you familiar with that identity first language, and, and hopefully you'll feel comfortable using that uh, in, in your work as well. But so yes, so again, this harkens back to that whole idea with the diagnostic criteria, that if love is not displayed in a way that's typically expected, that somebody therefore doesn't feel love. Um, and we know that that isn't true. In actuality, individuals with autism are full of love. We have so much love to offer. It's just a matter of finding someone who will respect that love and treat us the way that we deserve. That is quite frankly, very often the issue. Um, so let's talk about sex, right? So sex is everywhere. We live in a very sexualized society. It's on our billboards. It's on our TVs. It's used to sell products of all different stripes. But yet we don't have serious conversations about sex. We don't talk about it honestly and openly, um, which is which is really, really weird. You know, if, if you wondered what the consequences would be of the Puritans coming to our shores 400 years ago, this is pretty much it. Uh, sexual repression and really large belt buckles. That's kind of what they've left as their legacy. That's a problem. And then that discomfort becomes even more so the case when we the conversation involves individuals on the spectrum. Um, there is such a stigma and a taboo around disabled people, but especially, I think, people on the spectrum engaging in sexuality, being sexual beings. Um, but we're gonna, what we're going to do today is keep calm and talk about sex. We're going to get past what I call the blushing cheek phase, because if you're embarrassed or uncomfortable talking about sex, then your students uh, or children, whoever you support, is going to also feel embarrassed and uncomfortable talking about this. Um, and that's not a good thing. We, you know, peanut butter and jelly go great together, sex and shame, not so much. We don't want to put those things together, right? So I don't know how many of you are familiar with the secret language of emojis. I'm going to play a little brief clip for you, like 30 seconds, and then we're going to talk about the secret language of emojis. There's a whole kind of language. Yes, there is. Usually based around foodstuffs. <laughs> where they represent other things. Yeah. Yes. And asking someone out for a taco could easily be misinterpreted. <laughs> it turns out. Did you know that? <laughs> be careful. Did you know about this? Did you know about this? Yes, of course. Where have you, Where have you been? Stuff? I mean, the eggplant kind of looks like it doesn't even look like an eggplant. It's, it's you know. And then you've got the peach. And, the peach. and then yeah. if, you start, if you start adding to that the raindrops and all, yeah. you can do anything. <laughs> It's a minefield, clearly. Yeah. But do you text? Do you have a smartphone? I do, yes. Okay, then I've no idea how that passed you by. That's weird. <laughs> because, because I thought the emojis were just meant to represent what they represented. I didn't know it was this whole kind of other language you had to learn. Can you get explicit emojis? That's what we need. Yes, Apple needs to move forward and just call a vagina a vagina. <laughs> so what he's talking about is that the emojis, you know, that we have on our phones that we see all the time, carry kind of a, a, a secondary meaning to them. So the eggplant refers to a penis, the peach is a butt, the raindrops use your imagination. And if you're not aware of this kind of language that occurs through the use of emojis, you're missing out on a really big piece of the conversation. When we talk about sex in our society, when we talk about a sexuality, we talk about it in a kind of code, right? How many words are there for arm? An arm is an arm. How many slang terms are there for penis? There's a million slang terms. How many slang terms are there for sexual intercourse? There's countless. So if you're someone who already struggles you know, with, with language and with, and with understanding, have hidden meanings. If you aren't aware of this language in which we talk about sexuality, you're going to be missing out on a huge piece of the equation and have that much more difficulty, you know, navigating relationships. Um, I think this is to our detriment, frankly, that we talk about sexuality from the side instead of more directly. I think your neurotypicals would be a lot better off if we talked about these things more directly. But the the point overall is that it's not enough for us to simply teach the anatomical terms, the, you know, the, the medical terms. We have to be teaching people on the spectrum some of these slang terms as well, because it, when we when we use euphemisms, first of all, we shouldn't be using euphemisms anyway. Like somebody will say the word cookie in place of vagina. And then so someone can't identify if they've been abused, for instance. So that's why that is, is, is so harmful in that instance and why we do need to teach the medical terms. But we need to teach those slang terms on top of it because there's this whole other kind of, you know, having have, being able to navigate 
sexuality and relationships in our society for people on the spectrum is like learning a completely different language. So that's something we need to keep in mind when we're having these conversations and when we're trying to help people on the spectrum uh, understand and navigate uh, relationships and sexuality. Um, so why is it so important? Why is it so important for us to talk about sexuality? Well, as we have seen, as I've been saying, sexuality is not assumed to be part of the human experience for people on the spectrum. Um, I recall an anecdote from Dr. Isabel Hinault, who is a sexologist out of Montreal up in, in Quebec. And she uh, works with people on the spectrum, couples and singles. And she had told this anecdote about a young man who was on the spectrum who was experiencing erectile challenges. And he was trying so hard to maintain an erection that he was causing physical damage to himself. And she went to his doctor and it turned out that this was a side effect of a medication that he was on. She said to the doctor, why didn't you tell him that this was a side effect of this medication? The doctor said, well, he's not going to have sex. He's autistic. So this, this assumption, this rather arrogant assumption, ignorant assumption on the part of this doctor resulted in physical harm to this young man. And all too often, the assumptions that we make around autism and sexuality do result in harm to the people that we're trying to serve and trying to help, whether we mean for that to happen or not. Um, it's also very important for us to talk about this because as somebody much wiser than me once said, sex begins long before sex begins. What does that mean? Um, all too often, I think people get freaked out when they hear the word sex education because they, they think, oh, you're teaching autistic people how to have sex. No, we're teaching people how to live life. We're, this is about intimacy, right? This is about establishing intimacy, which can come in many different forms, not just physical. Intimacy can be emotional. It can be intellectual. It can, it can come in all, like I said, all different kind of, topographies. So these are things that you begin to establish with someone long before you're ever thinking about getting in between the sheets with them. And so that's why we have to start having these conversations sooner than we might even expect. People ask me frequently, how, how old should I wait for my child or when, when should I start talking about this? And I always say earlier than you think, um, because you know, as my good friend and colleague, Dr. Peter Gerhardt has said, what's cute at five is less cute when someone's 15 and we'll get them thrown in jail when they're 25. Um, and we'll go more into that in just a moment, but it's also important, you know, because as we just saw with the video we watched, communication is key. If you are someone who struggles with communication, verbal or nonverbal, you know, reading body language and, and, and nonverbal cues, um, it can be very, very challenging, not only to establish relationships, romantic relationships, but to maintain those relationships. So uh, it frustrates me sometimes when I see that so many of the, the books out there are centered, are, are written by neurotypical partners of autistic uh individuals and and as as if the communication challenge is only in that one you know only on the part of the person on the spectrum neurotypicals have to get better at communicating too you know the, the burden can't just be on people on the spectrum but all too often it, it frequently is um and of course the you know the other reason why it's so important for us to talk about autism and sexuality is that the consequences of not providing comprehensive and accurate sex education are much too great um one of those potential consequences unfortunately as we've said is sexual abuse um, sexual abuse occurs at much higher rates among people on the spectrum than NTs, but it's reported far less frequently. How can this be? Well, I always like to say we've had a Me Too movement in the neurotypical world, but we haven't had a Me Too movement in the autistic world, and we really, really need one. But, uh, you, you know, let's just say for a moment, because women tend to frequently be the victims of sexual abuse, although, of course, men can be victims as well. But if you know you're really not likely to be believed, autistic people are considered to be unreliable narrators of their own experiences on top of that. Um, oh, no, she didn't understand. And we were just having fun. We were just playing a game. She doesn't get it. And then all too often, in people in authority, law enforcement officials are more likely to side with the perpetrators than with the victims, which is, it, you know, kind of mirrors my experience growing up in school, where the administrators tended to side with the bullies uh, over me. So that double stigma really, I think, prevents you know, a, a lot of reporting of abuse, as well as the fact that we don't teach people on the spectrum what abuse looks like. Or abuse comes in many different forms. It can be physical, it can be emotional, verbal, sexual, financial. So a lot of times, a lot of people on the spectrum don't even know that they are being abused, right? Because we're not taught what abuse is. And, and then it becomes normalized in, in a lot of cases. So, and then who do you report it to, right? And you know, also often we, we we focus on the idea of stranger danger, uh, when in actuality, people on the spectrum are far more likely to be abused by someone who knows us, someone with access and opportunity, right? So if the person you trust, the person who's supposed to be looking out for you, is the one who's abusing you, then who do you tell? These are the conversations we have to have, because it really is a matter of life and death. It's a matter of keeping people on the spectrum uh, safe um, and, and, and empowering people on the spectrum, which I'll go into more a little bit later on as well. 
Um, and these are just some of the statistics that are out there. Graham Holmes, you know, 6.4% of youth with autism in their survey had a documented history of sexual abuse. Mandel et al, 16.6% of children in their study had been sexually abused. Brown Lavoy, 78% of respondents with ASD reported at least one instance of sexual victimization. And the thing about these statistics, and I don't share them to depress you or to upset you, but because this is the reality of what we're dealing with. But the thing about these statistics is that this is only what's been reported. I believe the actual numbers are probably much higher than this. But because owing to what we just said, that people on the spectrum are not taught what abuse looks like, are not taught how to report abuse, these this is I think that, that the that's why there's not more reporting. And that's why these numbers are seemingly low. Quote. There, I mean, there's no number that is acceptable. I would never sit here and say, oh, only 3% of autistic people are, are sexually abused. No, that number should be zero. The only acceptable number is zero. And I will not consider my work done until 0% of all autistic people are, are sexually abused in any form. I probably won't live to see that day come, but I sure hope that I do. Um, so this is what we're dealing with right now. This is the picture. And this is why we have to have these conversations to prevent this kind of thing from happening to people on the spectrum. And I'll, I'll go more into that in a little bit as well, why we're not more proactive uh, in this regard. Um, so what better way then to understand the unique experiences of people on the spectrum than with me to tell you about what I've been through and the experiences that I've had. Um, so I think you all saw my bio probably when you registered for this webinar, so I won't read all this. This is you know, just some of the things that I'm currently involved with. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a relationship coach at the Rucker Center for Adult Autism Services in New Brunswick, New Jersey. I'm also an autism sexuality advocate and consultant through my own business, Ascot Consulting. Uh, I was in the film version of Indifferent Key, the story of autism based on the New York Times bestselling book by John Dahman and Karen Zucker. I've recently co-authored my first book chapter uh, with Dr. Gerhardt and Dr. Jess Kauke, um, called Sexuality and Sexuality Education with Individuals with Autism, What You Should Know But Probably Don't, which is in the textbook that you see here. And, and I'm currently writing uh, my first book, which is called The Naughty Audi, which is a memoir of my experiences with dating as a woman uh, on the spectrum. But... Way back in 1996, long before any of that was even the remotest thought in my mind, uh, I was 13 years old. Uh, and I was no different from a lot of 13-year-olds. I was in the throes of puberty, going through the same physical and biological changes as my neurotypical peers. And I was beginning to develop crushes. And these were pretty much my crushes at that time. There's kind of a pattern with the floppy hair thing. I don't know what was going on with me, but... Um, these are some of the crushes that I was having. And you might wonder what Davy Jones from the Monkees is doing down here. Uh, I discovered the Monkees on Nickelodeon Summer Block Party when I was 13. And my dad's Monkees created his cassette tape and fell in love with them. And Davy became my favorite. And of course, it did wonders for my popularity, having pictures of a band that was popular 30 years earlier taped to my locker door. That was sarcasm. I'm autistic and I can use sarcasm. It did nothing for my popularity, having those pictures on my locker. But so it was, these, these were the crushes I began to have. However, um, even though I was, you know, right on track, physically developing, going through those changes, I didn't have my first kiss until I was 17. So 12, 13 years old, you know, going through puberty, physical changes, curiosities, crushes, nothing in the way of actual tangible experience till I was 17. That's a big gap, right? And, and kind of the, the, the recurring theme, which you'll see as I tell you my story, is one of disconnect, that there was a repeated sense of disconnect through the experiences that I was having. And in this particular instance, um, there was a real disconnect between the, what I was curious about, the things I had questions about, and any learning opportunities that I had to explore these things. Um, so as I started to go through puberty, that disconnect manifested even further. Uh, I, I didn't feel like I was inside my body. Uh, I felt as though, uh, I, you know, my body didn't belong to me, which is a very dangerous place to be in, and that sets you up to be very vulnerable. Uh, potentially. I often compare it to a balloon barely tethered to the earth, which is what I'm showing you kind of in the picture here. That was how I felt about my body. And when you don't have a sense of ownership of your own body, again, like I said, that creates this environment for someone to come in and say, oh, you know, you're, you're so beautiful and, and uh, you know, I, I, I can help you and I can, you know, it's very easy for a predator to, to come in there and do that. Um, but again, being on a spectrum, I think, you know, we misunderstand the effects of puberty on autistic individuals, right? And I think that was certainly the case for me, um, that we have this assumption, you know, that if someone isn't, again, expressing things in the way that we typically expect, that they're automatically not feeling them. We don't do this for neurotypical teenagers. I don't know why. 
We, for some reason, expect autistic teens to be able to fully articulate every single thing that they're feeling, or we don't believe that they're actually feeling them. We would never expect that of a neurotypical teenager. If a neurotypical teenager you know, grunted or went up to their room after you asked them how their day was, you know, you'd be like, oh, you know, he just, he just doesn't want to talk about it. It's whatever. He's just going to go up to his room. But if the same were to happen with an autistic teenager, oh, we, we, you know, the assumption seems to be, oh, you know, he's fine. Everything's fine. Nothing's going on. Um, and that's such a dangerous kind of mindset for us to, us to be in, to assume, you know, it makes me think of the show uh, Atypical, if any of you are familiar with the show Atypical, all of the main characters, we see their internal lives, right? We see the internal life of the mom, the dad, the sister, but we do not see the internal life of Sam, the young man on the spectrum. Um, and, and to me, that speaks to how neurotypicals make assumptions uh, about the internal lives of people on the spectrum or the lack thereof. And that's a, a really big problem. Um, you know, when, when we're talking about that. I'm not a fan of the show, regrettably, Regina. I'm sorry to tell you. I felt that the portrayal was very one-dimensional, that the, the young man was kind of a caricature and a walking checklist of symptoms and nobody's a walking checklist of symptoms in my in my experience, as well as the fact that there was a lot of kind of uh, misogyny underpinning a lot of the things I saw on the show. Him, uh, spoiler alert, him breaking into his therapist's home, him locking his girlfriend in the closet. Like these are horrific things that should never be excused. And it doesn't matter if someone's on the spectrum or not, um, which is unfortunately, you know, we, we end up having a lot of people on the spectrum in the criminal justice system, even though we're much more likely to be the victims um, of abuse, you end up having people who, who are perpetrators. So uh, so that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> but um, so because of everything that I was going through, you know, growing up, uh, there was no time to really have the talk, right? So, you know, with the bullying I was experiencing and my parents trying to get support services from the school, but we never had the kind of that birds and the bees talk. And I, and I am of the opinion that that talk is best left to the movies because sexuality isn't just one talk. It's many talks, right? It's lots of conversations over the, over the lifespan, or at least it should be. Because the things that I had questions about when I was 13, 14 years old were not the same things I had questions about when I was 17 or 18 or when I was 22, when I was 27. You know, that those those things change over time. Um, and, and I think that that's a crucially important thing for us to remember is that people on the spectrum do grow and do change. We don't stay in the same place. You know, like neurotypicals, our, our, our problems don't go away. They just change as we change and grow up. So just something very important to, to keep in mind here. Um, but again, because of all the social problems I was having and because I, I didn't, I, I had a complete lack of experiences in real life with dating and, and trying to make those connections, I wound up kind of you know going to the worst place you can to find out about sex in the first place, which was my peers and online. And I found friendships online. And I often say that I'm the first person who went on the internet to be themselves instead of to be someone else. Um, because it was very clear to me, it was made clear to me by society, by my peers, by my teachers, that being who I was was not acceptable. So I was desperate you know, for this validation. I, I My self-esteem was non-existent uh, at this point. And I started going into chat rooms for fans of the Backstreet Boys, Yahoo chat rooms. I'm dating myself horribly here. But, um, you know, I consequently made a group of friends in there. And they often say that men watch their porn and women read their porn. And that was certainly true for me. And I began reading and writing erotic fiction voraciously around this time, around 14, 15 years old. Um, and I became the designated smart writer for our little group of friends. And they'd say, Amy, you know, write me a, a story about me and AJ. And uh, and I'd be like, okay, and I and I'd write a story as far as my virginal fifteen year old imagination could stretch, which was pretty far, in all fairness. But um, you know, the internet may have been a little bit different back then. We didn't have TikTok and Snapchat and Kick and all those things, but we still had predators, right? And, and I was so innately vulnerable without even realizing it. And one day, a man came into the chat room and said that he was AJ, who was my favorite member, and I believed him. I had no reason to think he wasn't who he said he was. I didn't understand people being duplicitous or lying. Um, and he essentially preyed on me. He, um, you know, sent me a letter, a, a, a typed letter, not handwritten and a fake diamond ring. And unbeknownst to me at the time, my parents hired a private investigator to look into him. And he was some guy who lived in Michigan. Uh, so <laughs> shout out to the Midwest. But I don't know who he really was. Um, and kind of the worst thing that occurred was that he asked me to send him a picture of my breasts. And this was before digital cameras, but my family had a flatbed scanner on the on top of the desk where the computer was. Because you remember back in the days when everybody had a computer room, which is the only place that a computer was in the house. So I hoisted um, all 85 pounds of myself onto the flatbed scanner and I scanned my boobs and I sent it to him. And he sent the picture to my friends in the chat room. 
And at the time, I was completely thrilled. I thought, oh my gosh, he loved what he saw so much that he wanted to share it with everybody. This is amazing. This is how naive I was, spectacularly so. And I was totally thrilled right up until my one friend said, oh, Amy, those are your breasts. I thought that they were ears because they were so small. And so that kind of destroyed my self-esteem all over again. Um, but he really did prey on me. And it took me the longest time to even categorize it as such because I never really realized that that was what happened. But And I was lucky that nothing worse than that happened. I got very, very lucky in that regard. But again, my reasons for being online were because I was experiencing so many disappointments in real life again and again. Um, When I was 15 years old, a boy moved in across the street and he had the cutest freckles I'd ever seen and a bowl haircut that put Julius Caesar to shame. And again, I wanted to establish what I talked about earlier, which was that intimacy with him, but, you know, emotional intimacy. It's not that I was trying to have sex with him, but I wanted to be with him and I didn't know how to do that. And I would compensate with with physical closeness. So he'd be at the computer. He'd say, Amy, come here. I want to show you something. And I'd come over. Oh, okay. What is it? And it's hard for for you to see on the screen, but I would basically be on top of him, leaning right over him in his personal bubble, steadily pissing him off more and more uh, until he finally stopped talking to me. And every time I see him across the street, I would wave and he would glare at me. And about 50 or 100 waves and glares later, I finally got the message. Um... As I mentioned earlier, my first kiss wasn't until I was 17. Uh, It was in an ice skating rink during a game of truth or dare, as you do. Uh, And again, I developed a big crush on this boy. And I remember calling uh, him at home. We didn't go to the same school, so I I wasn't seeing him at school. But I called him at home and his mother answered the phone. What are you doing? How dare you call here? Don't you ever call here again? I miss when you could slam phones down like that, by the way. It's not really effective if I try to do it with my iPhone here. But what no one could explain to me was why this woman was so angry that a 17-year-old girl was calling her 14-year-old son. And you may have noticed with some of the students you support that they tend to feel more comfortable with peers who are younger than they are or with adults rather than peers their own age. And that was certainly true for me. And so I think developmentally, emotionally, I was probably closer to where he was at that time, but no one could explain to me why this wasn't okay. And I never saw him again uh, after that. Incidentally, I found out several years ago that he came out as gay, which doesn't surprise me given my track record, but there you go. And then finally, my senior prom. Okay, so here I am. I'm raised on a healthy diet of teen movies. You know, she's all that and stuff like that. And I thought, this is going to be my perfect high school moment. I'll go to the prom and I'll have friends. Everyone will like me. It'll be wonderful. Uh, And I had a crush on the boy the whole year long. He was a junior. The only way juniors go to the senior prom is with a senior. And so I asked him and he said yes. But he was friends with the seniors. I wasn't. So we had the few kind of obligatory slow dances But then the majority of the night, he was on the dance floor dancing with other girls while I sat at the the table writing poetry on scraps of paper. So I did not get my perfect high school moment. It was yet another in a series of crushing disappointments. Um, And again, just contributed to that kind of non-existent self-esteem that I carried with me all through high school. But then college, college comes. And along with it, my first boyfriend ever. Oh, it's a miracle. It's all I've ever wanted. Um, But I had absolutely no idea how to be a girlfriend. I, I refer to him as my starter boyfriend because I had no idea what I was doing. And I, I don't know if any of, we have any BCBAs here at all, but I kind of task it, analyzed the heck out of this. I, I thought, well, what, 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 what does it mean to be a girlfriend? Well, I have to laugh at his jokes, even if they're not funny. I have to go where he wants to go. I have to be nice to his parents. So I kind of tried to play the part of a girlfriend. Uh, not that I wasn't being myself, but it was my way of trying to make sense of something that ultimately didn't make sense to me. And I didn't have any kind of knowledge base for. Um, But once again, there was a disconnect between kind of what was expected of me as a girlfriend and what I was really able to do. He was a year older than I was, more experienced than I was. So I fell into this position of feeling that I had to defer to him, that I had to, you know, that my needs and wants were secondary or if at all, you know, I, it was very hard for me to stand up for myself. Um, And ultimately, you know, he, what, what ended up was what ended up was that he dumped me not once, but twice. He dumped me, we got back together, and then he dumped me again. And I had convinced myself in my mind that we needed to stay friends. I'm a very loyal person when it comes to friendships. It's very difficult for me to let friendships go for any reason. And he became kind of an emotionally abusive jerk uh, after we broke up, although he started to be one before that because he kept saying he was going to dump me for a quote, a real woman, meaning one with breasts and hips, neither of which I really had at that moment. Um, But uh, so 
after we broke up, uh, you know, he was living, we were living in the same dorm. He was in a dorm room on the first floor with a mutual friend. I lived in a solo room on the third floor. And one night we're out on the stoop of this building. It's about two o'clock in the morning. And the mutual friend is having a cigarette. And I'm trying to talk to him. And my ex is like, go away, get out of here. Nobody wants you here. Leave us alone. And I'm all, you know, it's a free country. I have every right to be out here. And he proceeded to physically assault me, which sounds sort of worse than it was. But he uh, kicked me in the shin and he slapped my forehead with the back of his hand. And he was six foot three and I'm five foot zero. You can't see on the computer here, but I'm I'm a petite person. So it wasn't really evenly matched. And um we get back in the dorm and my friend says, Amy, go get the RA and tell her what happened. I'll back you up. Just go get the RA. Just go, go. So I got the RA. I told the RA what happened. I wound up going to the police and I filed for a protection from abuse order, which is similar to a restraining order. I had to testify in court and my friend testified on my behalf. I won the order. Uh, my ex had to move out of the dorm, no third party contact. And we had an on-campus hearing with the Dean of Student Affairs, which I also won. Um, and <laughs> Yeah, and I haven't seen her ever since. He kind of dropped out the face of the earth as far as I know. But it was up until that point, one of the most traumatic things I'd ever been through. Although it was nothing compared to what would be coming next, which I'll tell you in just a moment. But uh, one of the great things about being with him, because there were, it wasn't all bad, right? Relationships are never all one thing or the other, I don't think. And it was a learning experience. And I mentioned earlier about that disconnect with my body. And that began to change around this time when I was with him um, and, and started to become sexually active. Um, we didn't actually have intercourse. Um, I always like to say the two best things that my ex ever did was introduce me to Japanese food and leave me a virgin. But we did do other stuff. And I remember one time looking down when, when we were being intimate in his dorm room. And all of a sudden I realized, oh my gosh, I have pubic hair and it has a function. There's a lot of it. It's like the Black Forest. I should do something about that. Um, but of course, you know, he's like a chia pet. And I don't get to say anything about that. Not really fair, in my opinion. But it was the first time I really felt a sense of connection to my body. It was the first time I'd been aware. Of, of that, because when I went through my first period, uh, I ruined five pairs of underwear before my mother came in the bathroom one day and said, oh, you're a woman now. And I said, huh? I, I had no clue what was going on. And I just had no awareness of, of myself. So this was just the beginning of that. And it was the beginning also of seeing myself as a sexual being. So not just someone who somebody would want to have sex with, but who could be capable of providing pleasure to someone, which I never thought would be possible. So it was it was a tremendous thing to, to, to kind of have this this realization as a result of this relationship, you know, even though things ended as badly as they did, um, I, you know, and I also consequently discovered um, masturbation after this, which was, was not something I knew girls could even do. When, when I was taught about it in health class in school, it was always framed as something that boys did. But this kind of speaks to the idea that if we want to keep people on the spectrum safe, it's not just about um you know, don't do this and don't have sex and that. It's also about, you know, pleasure and letting and having people get to know their own bodies, right? Because then that lets you know what you're comfortable with and what you're not comfortable with that enables someone to set stronger boundaries and to be able to, to stand up for themselves more. So this was really the first time that I started to be able to do that because prior to that, I remember looking at him and asking him, oh, did I enjoy that? Did I like that? And if I didn't, you know, he would say, oh, well, all the other girls I've been with like that, so I thought that there was something wrong with me. I thought that I was the one who was broken. And that's, again, another very vulnerable place to be in. Um, so this was a tremendous kind of, uh, you know, high water mark. I think that's the phrase for, for my sexual development and for beginning to learn who I was. Um, and another first that I experienced in college uh, was that I, you know, I had a stalker. Again, a lot of firsts happening. Um, and I, you know, it took me a long time, like I said, uh, when I talked about uh, being you know, um, I forgot what I was that. but, but essentially this man saw me at a conference in New England and, um, you know, he, he became obsessed with me and he was 37, 38 years old and I was 22. Uh, and I, you know, it took me the longest time to understand that this was stalking. Right. Um, and, and he was on the spectrum as well. And there were a lot of boundaries and lines I didn't set at the time because I didn't understand, you know, that, that, that it was okay to do that. I didn't have the confidence and sense of self-awareness to do that. Um, and he insisted on meeting me in person, even though I didn't really want to. And this is a picture that was taken in my hometown uh, with him. I met him on Long Island where I grew up. And I took a male friend with me so I wouldn't be alone, but how comfortable do I look in that picture? I don't think I look too comfortable, right? But, uh, you know, kind of the, the, the worst of it was that he actually, so after I graduated college, I'll, I'll be going into this in, in a moment, I moved to Seattle, Washington. And when I was living there, he drove 
from where he lived in Massachusetts to Pennsylvania, where I had been in college, to my friend's place of work because he wanted to ask her about me. And I never told him where she worked. I was afraid she would think I did. Um, but again, you know, the big thing for me is that it took me the longest time to recognize this as stalking because we have very specific ideas about the kind of people who get stalked, right? Movie stars get stalked or famous people. Who am I? But the truth is that stalking is about the person doing the stalking, not the person being stalked. Anyone could have been this man's target. It just happened to be me. So it just took the longest time to even understand that, that, that this was what really happened. And, and there's a lot of things now that this happened now that I would not forgive, that I would not allow. Um, because... This is how, like I said, many people on the spectrum end up in the criminal justice system because of committing these offenses without realizing it. And the law doesn't care if you're on the spectrum. You break the law, you go to jail. That's that's it, you know. So um, that's that's a big problem. Um, so as I said before, I moved to Seattle after I graduated. And, and I could kid myself about why I moved out there. I could kid myself about you know, oh, I was looking for new experiences. I wanted to find myself. But I moved out there for the worst reason you could, which is because of a guy. And I met this guy again online on a message board for fans of uh, of a movie of a movie film director. And I was very, you know, kind of, uh, I don't know if diplomatic is the word, but very, you know, uh, pragmatic. That's the word. Very pragmatic about my feelings. Because when you exist in this world as someone on the spectrum, you often have to justify that you feel the things you do. Because people often want to tell you, oh, well, are you sure that's what you're feeling? Are you sure? You know, and, and it's this thing where you, you're not allowed to be the, the best judge of, of yourself. You're not allowed to be an expert on you. Everybody else is an expert on you. So I, I knew that I had loved my college boyfriend, but I hadn't been in love with him. Um, and I, you know, I like I said, moved 3,000 miles away from all my friends and all my family. And I remember sitting in his car one night and I turned to him and I said, you know, Jonathan, I, I think that I'm in love with you. And his answer was, I know. Uh, and he wasn't Han Solo. You might have thought he was, but he actually wasn't. Um, but, you know, the, the funny thing about being in love is that it doesn't matter if you're on the spectrum or not. It still makes you stupid. And when you have rose-colored glasses on, all the flags look red. So I thought to myself, oh, of course he knows. I didn't have to tell him. He knows me better than I know myself. Of course I didn't have to tell him. And um, I had, had, like I said, I had had opportunities to lose my virginity in college, but I knew I wasn't ready. And I knew, and I decided that he was the one. He was the one I was going to do it with. And you often hear that young people think they're invincible and nothing can happen to them. I'm autistic, so everything has happened to me. So I, I got on the birth control pill before I moved out there. And I waited the full month you're supposed to wait for the pill to kick in because I didn't want to get pregnant. And I made sure that we had condoms. And I told him uh, to wear a white button down shirt because I always wanted to unbutton a guy's shirt when we were going to make love. I had the bottle of wine picked out. I had the music burn on the CD. This is this is pre like MP3 players. I was super super prepared. Right? I thought I I was like totally ready. And I even went so far as to buy a University of Washington Huskies cheerleader uniform because he said he had a thing for cheerleaders. So, um, but again, I was still in this place of like low self esteem, low self confidence. I thought if I screw this up, he'll never want to have sex with me again. Nobody will ever want to have sex with me again. Um, and I thought I need some kind of feedback, and I need to know you know, if I've done a good job, as prepared as I, I'm sure I am, because I've written about sex for all these years now. So first, how could I not be prepared? I need some kind of feedback. And I thought, well, when you eat at a restaurant or, or you stay at a hotel, they had these cards that you can fill out to talk about what your experience was like. So I created a sexual intercourse comment card, which you can see here. This is the front of the card. Um, tongue slightly in cheek, but but entirely serious. Um, and, and, uh, and then these were some of the questions on the back, you know, what did you enjoy most about the sex session? What do you think could have been better? Please rate the following from one to five, the outfit I had on pre intercourse, my facial expressions during intercourse, uh, my volume, is there anything I can do in the future to get you aroused more quickly and maximize your pleasure during our session? Um, and when I told my colleague, Dr. Gerhardt about this, he said, Amy, that's the most autistic thing I've ever heard of. And I think the world would be a better place if everyone did this. Um, and and so the guy that I lost my virginity to, he'd actually filled this out. He humored me, you know, for, for whatever reason. And um, as I said before, I had bought that cheerleader uniform. And while we started off the events of the night naked, at one point he had some trouble maintaining his, you know, his erection, whatever. And I said, well, I've got, I got a surprise. Close your eyes. So I went in the closet and I put on the uniform and I wound up losing my virginity in the University of Washington Huskies cheerleader uniform, which is weird. But that's how it happened. Um, but there's a problem with these questions you may or may not have noticed. Um, and the problem with these questions, I didn't notice until years later with the gift of hindsight. And the problem is that they're all about his pleasure and enjoyment. 
There's nothing about whether or not I enjoyed myself. Um, and I think that is a testament to the fact that up until, you know, not that long ago, all my stories, my stories that I wrote, my erotic story ended with the guy having an orgasm. I didn't even know that was something women could could do. But I think, you know, not just being autistic, but also as women in our society, we're expected to put the needs of others ahead of our own. Um, that's just sort of, you know, the, the, the way that it goes. And um, I mean, I just remember at one point, you know, I thought we were going to be looking into each other's eyes, but he was six foot five. So I just had a wall of torso like right here the whole time. And uh, but, you know, after it was over, I went to the window and I opened up the window and I, and I screamed out. I am no longer a virgin. Do you hear that, Seattle? Because I was so thrilled. And he, meanwhile, he'd run off to the bathroom to wash off, which was a red flag I should have seen coming. But um, yes, so it was sort of a anticlimactic, climactic moment, if you will. But um, the inevitable was to follow, um, which you know shouldn't be surprising. Which was that six months later, after we'd had intercourse eight times, and I did count, um, it turned out that he had a girlfriend he'd forgotten to tell me about. Uh, and he was sleeping with half the women in the city limits of Seattle. Um, and he was so much of a coward that when I found all this out, uh, I found out either on the phone or online. He never confronted me face to face. We had no face to face conversation about this ever. And um, his girlfriend proceeded to harass me at all hours of the day and night, uh, would call me, uh, would threaten to kill me if I didn't leave town, wanted to know every detail of my experiences with him. Um, and I sort of became a target in a way that, that I never had been before. And he, uh, and I couldn't even bear to look at the, cheer, the cheerleader uniform anymore. And he, I had, I had given him an engraved pen and a monogrammed journal, and he returned them both to me in a box outside my apartment building at six in the morning. And I took the pen and the journal and the cheerleader uniform, and I put them in a brown paper bag, and I went to the side of my apartment building, and I set them on fire. And it was this kind of beautiful, cathartic moment right up until the fire trucks came because the alarms went off and I thought I was going to get evicted, but luckily I didn't. Um, but then on top of everything, he wrote me an email uh, saying, your first time was the grossest thing I ever did. You were just a retarded whore that I effed. You meant nothing to me. Keep on deluding yourself and thinking that we had something. You know, you're crazy. You're this, you're that. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, I met him on a message board and his girlfriend went into his account on the message board and posted that email for everybody to read. So this private thing suddenly became... An 11 page thread, you know, that the whole world was commenting on basically to tell him what a jerk he was and how could he do this. And um, it it so makes me emotional to this day because I don't know how you could do that to someone. I honestly have no idea how someone could do that to someone and sleep at night. Um, but uh, especially someone who's in love with you, because all these other girls that he was sleeping with were, were calling his girlfriend and saying how great he was in bed. But I was the one who fell in love with him. So I was the easy target. And um, every time the phone would ring, I would pick it up, hoping it was him saying that he was picking me over her um, because I was in love, you know, and, and I was stupid. And, and, uh, and um, you know, the way I moved on, I learned that there are two types of moving on, right? And the first type of moving on was, uh, I mean, he was ripped out of my life. I had no choice. Um, and I would say it took me about seven years to fully get over what he did to me. Um, I mean... I, I even remember sitting in the SeaTac airport and calling him one last time. And, um, you know, my, my my best friend at the time was like, come back to New York to stay with me for a couple of days. And, and, and I remember on the phone, he said, we're getting married, get the F out of our lives, you know, like, okay, good luck with that, buddy. Yeah. Uh, but um, it was, I was just, you know, and I was on the plane and I couldn't eat anything. And the stewardess came and asked if I was okay. And I burst into tears and she took me into the galley and I just poured out everything to her and she was so kind and so lovely. And I, I'll never forget that. Um, but, you know, that's the thing. I thought that if I left my apartment, I'd feel better because, you know, I, I wouldn't be in this place where so many memories existed. But what nobody tells you is you take it all with you. It's all in here. Um, so it was very, very hard. Uh, and um, the, the second way I knew that I'd moved on, I think it's my next slide. Let me see. Uh, OK, was that I developed feelings for someone new. And I didn't think that would ever be possible. Um, and then things ended up not working out with that guy, but I was still okay afterward. So that was kind of the way I do. I don't think you ever fully get over something like this, but you you do move on. That's the difference, right? We should never, you know, expect that anyone, whether you're on the spectrum or not, would get over being traumatized, being harmed in these ways. Um, and just because somebody is on the spectrum doesn't mean that something like this would affect them any less, right? So, you know, again, the thing I often say is is that the only thing that could teach me how to deal with a broken heart was having my heart broken. I mean, you can't protect somebody from that. You know what I mean? You can't 
hope someone will never experience something like that. Sometimes experience is the only teacher, even though we write so many songs about it and there's so many movies about it. Um, I had to go through it in order to be able to know that I could get through it and come out the other side. Um, and it's funny how these things can sometimes have an epilogue, right? So um, in 2016, I went to New Orleans for a conference uh, and I found out to the grapevine that he wasn't living in Seattle anymore. He was still, he was now living in New Orleans and he was working as a bartender in a hotel three blocks from where I was staying for the conference. And uh, I was still chasing this notion of closure, right? Because we had never had that in-person conversation. Um, and I wanted, I wanted that. I thought if I can just get, get that, I'll be able to really have closure. Um, and I went to the bar against my better judgment uh, and he wasn't working that day, it turned out. You know, because I saw a guy from behind turn around. It wasn't him. I said, is Jonathan working that day? And he wasn't. And in that moment, I had a rush of emotions flood over me. I felt relief. I felt sadness. I felt happiness. And I knew with perfect, absolute clarity that I had to go to that bar to know that I didn't have to go to that bar. That there was no closure that he was ever going to give to me that I hadn't already gotten from myself. Uh, and it's, it's very similar to the validation that I chased for so many years, the validation of wanting to be told that I wasn't broken, that I was okay through the way I was. No one could give that to me. You can't give that to your students necessarily. No one, you know, they ha it has to come from themselves. And that came when I looked in the mirror and saw the person that I liked. And that took a very, very long time. And uh, I kind of had a full circle moment here because uh, in, tw in 2022, I went to Seattle again for the first time since I'd moved out 15 years earlier. I was there for another conference and I walked to where my old apartment was. And on the way, I, I tripped on the sidewalk and I scraped my knee and I got back up. I said, there's a metaphor here. And I looked at the building and it looked exactly the same, but I was the same. And, and I knew that it was different. I knew I wasn't the same person who had left there 15 years earlier. And it was, and I felt just so overwhelmed to think that had grown so much and I hadn't been stopped by what he did to me. My pain didn't live there anymore. Um, so it was a, a real genuine truth, full circle moment and it meant a great deal to me. Um, so, so with all this in mind, you know, the question I sought to answer and thinking about the experiences that I've had and that's by no means the end, that's just kind of, I don't have time to go into the stuff that's happened uh, since that, <laughs> which is kind of more of me getting hurt by ridiculous men. But um, in thinking about all of this, and, and by the way, the reason that's important is because I want you to know that, that nobody has all the answers to this, right? Anyone who says that they have all the answers is either not very bright or they're lying. And I I may not have had my happily ever after yet, but that doesn't mean it'll be happily ever never. I'm, you know, I'm still keeping open to the idea because I still believe I have love to give and I hope to find someone who will appreciate it. Um, but keeping all this in mind, you know, the question I, I've been looking to answer for years now is how can we help individuals on the spectrum learn dating and sexuality skills? Um, you know, in the current research literature, what we have right now is better than what we did have, which was nothing. For years and years and years, we had nothing. Um, but most of what exists right now is anecdotal. It's about cataloging and analyzing the experiences of people on the spectrum in, instead of teaching skills. So kind of qualitative research instead of quantitative. And I don't know where researchers have been. I don't know why they haven't been talking to autistic people before now, like we've been here for quite some time. But um, there's plenty of things about teaching social skills, but nothing really with dating skills. And we need that. You know, we, the, the absence of that is not an indication of that not being of that being of that not being a problem. People, I think, tend to think that well, this is this isn't being addressed in the, in the literature, so therefore it must not be a problem. So I'm not going to do research on it. And it's this kind of cyclical thing that feeds on itself. And then you know, all too often when when we, you know, we come in to try to address these issues, sexual behaviors of any kind, it's almost always to stop something instead of to teach something, right? So we we would never do this. You know, if a kid needs to cross the street safely, we're not going to say, oh, I'll just wait till Timmy gets hit by a car and then I'll teach him to cross the street safely. No, that's completely unacceptable. Yet, for whatever reason, we wait until something terrible has happened. Uh, in this area until we decide to address it. Why are we waiting until somebody who's potentially been traumatized, either, you know, been they've been indecently exposed by someone or they committed it or whatever it could be? Why do we wait until that happens to address this? It, it makes no sense to me. Um, and uh, oh, thank you, Megan. I was confused about that. I didn't realize they were two different shows. Thank you for the clarification. So in the chat, folks are talking about a show called On the Spectrum. 
which is on uh, HBO and then Love on the Spectrum is on Netflix. So thank you for that clarification. Um, so yes, so we, we tend to just wait until something has happened and, and it's, it, it's tremendously to our detriment. And I think it speaks to, again, that discomfort that we have around sexuality and specifically the sexuality of people on the spectrum. Um, so why is there this reluctance, right? Why is there such a reluctance on the part of teachers, professionals, BCBAs, uh, psychologists, whoever it might be, to teach dating and sexuality skills? For my, my for my students and young adults out there, I feel you on a, obviously a very deep personal level. I know that nobody ever took the time to try to talk about this stuff with me. Nobody wanted to. Um, and I know how frustrating and difficult that must be. So my hope is that the folks who are here watching this webinar today who support autistic students will get something out of this and be inclined to take action. Um, but again, you know, part of this reluctance comes from those preconceived ideas about autism, right? Those taboos, this, this, this idea that autistic people are, are not sexual, are not interested in sexuality or dating. So therefore it's not something that needs to be addressed. Um, very frequently when I've attended conferences, spoken at conferences, it's always been three specific areas that keep getting addressed, which is housing, employment, and recreation. Relationships, building relationships, Sexuality has has just not been something that's historically been addressed at conferences. Now it is much more frequently. Now I see it being addressed, but still, I, I get frustrated when I, when I get emails about conferences or whatever it could be, and I don't see that topic anywhere on them. Or I might see the topic being addressed, but it's by the same presenter again and again, and we're not hearing the autistic perspective in these presentations. Right? That's the other piece: is that we need to hear more from autistic people on this area. Um, and that's something I, I find is frequently missing. Um, if we were able to do that, I, I have found that I've had so many parents say to me, you know, after hearing you speak, I, now I see my child as a person, not just as my child. You know what I mean? Because that's, I think it's very difficult for a lot of parents to separate those things out, especially when autism is in, in the equation, right? So your child isn't just your child, they're a human being too. And they, and they have these same feelings and desires and need support in that, in that vein. Um, but again, you know, we tend to focus heavily on the idea of compliance too, right? Making sure that autistic people are doing what we need them to do, sitting when we need them to sit, wearing what we need them to wear. And we forget that, you know, creating somebody who's overly compliant is essentially creating a perfect victim, right? It's creating someone who's going to go off with somebody who says that they're a person in authority. And you don't want that. You don't want someone to go off with someone who, who says that they're in charge. And we forget that non-compliance is just as much of a social skill and a safety skill, right? It's just as important for someone to know when to say no and to be able to say no, to have that no be effective. Because what does it matter if somebody says no and, and that no is not effective and not acknowledged? And right, and we know, of course, we all have to do things in life that we don't want to do. It's it's not saying that, you know, um, like if somebody has to do math homework and okay, well, you know, I don't no, I don't want to do math homework. Well, okay, we won't do it right now. Let's come back to it later, you know. But in other instances, in this area, it can have serious consequences, right? So we're not great at respecting the boundaries of people on the spectrum, really at all. You know, we, we take someone to someone's house, you know, okay, give, give grandma a kiss. I don't want to kiss grandma. Too bad you have to kiss grandma. And that tells someone, even from a young age, that their boundaries don't matter, that, that their body doesn't belong to them, right? And that's, that's that can have serious consequences and repercussions later on. So we have to kind of move away, I think, from compliance-based um, you know, you know, interventions and, and only focusing on that and thinking about um, non-compliance as a social skill, non-compliance as self-advocacy, right? I, I just was on a panel about this at the ABAI conference in Denver. So that's something that we need to keep in mind, especially in this particular area. Um, and I think another reason why there's a reluctance to teach these skills is that a lot of teachers and professionals don't know how to teach these skills, right? There's an assumption on, on the part of many people that you have to be an expert in order to teach these skills. Well, first of all, I hate the word expert because to me, it carries with it a static authority that cannot be challenged. And second of all, I don't think anybody's an expert because we're learning so much all the time about sexuality and we're learning so much all the time about autism. Our knowledge is constantly changing. So that's why I call myself a specialist. So rather than needing to have all the answers, understand that nobody has all the answers, right? And it's better to give a damn than to not because as an adult now, I can tell you, I remember the people who tried. I remember the teachers who didn't turn a blind eye, the teachers who didn't write it off as kids being kids, the teachers who cared, even, even if they didn't have all the answers, even if, even if they didn't get it right the first time, dare to give a damn. That's what I always say. Um, and then finally, another kind of reason for the reluctance to teach these skills is there may be incompatible school, like I said, 
curricula in certain states. I don't know in your states if it's like abstinence only um, mandates or not, but that can often, you know, be prohibitive for trying to introduce comprehensive sex education for students on the spectrum and students off the spectrum too. Um, but that also, yeah, again, uh, you know, another thing that kind of falls under this heading is students from certain religious backgrounds or cultural backgrounds that that don't allow for discussions about sexuality or masturbation or whatever it may be. And, you know, I always say to these people, like, I, I have very little patience for that as a rationale, because this really is a matter of life and death. This is about your, your child, you know, being a human being in this world and being able to experience the full breadth of humanity. Because to deny autistic people our sexuality is to deny us part of the human experience. And it's it's simply unacceptable. Um, so how can professionals across disciplines address and improve discussions about autism and sexuality? A couple of ways, I think, and this is by no means an exhaustive list, just as the previous slide was not in any way exhaustive. Um, like I said, be proactive instead of reactive. I, I kind of mentioned this a bit already, but we were much too reactive in this area. We wait until something has happened before we do anything. This, this is not acceptable, right? These conversations can begin in kindergarten, conversations about bodily autonomy. Um, and, and Abby, I'm gonna have a slide at the end with my contact info, so stay tuned. There will be a slide, don't you worry. Um, but, but yes, you know, bodily autonomy and boundaries, who can touch your body, who can't touch your body. Um, all these things can start from, from early, early on. And are are so crucially important to so you know keeping people on the spectrum safe and empowering people on the spectrum to make the same choices as our neurotypical peers later on. Um, again, maybe also reframing autism and sexuality when we talk when we talk about it from a behavioral perspective. As I, I have a master's degree in ABA, and so my background is in behavior analysis, and I, I see this you know that oftentimes we're talking about redu reducing sexual behaviors. Well, okay, but these behaviors are connected to a human being. And, and it might be a good idea to understand why this person is expressing themselves in this way. And how can we figure out a way for this person to express themselves in a way that is not harmful to themselves or anybody else? Um, yes, Tammy, 100%. Just want to emphasize what Tammy said in the chat, that the forced kiss and hug thing is dangerous for that reason. Exactly. That we're not in charge of our feelings for others or our body. 150%. Um, and I think that's especially true for people on the spectrum, we're, we're, because as I mentioned earlier, we're, how we're not how we're made to feel that we're not the experts on ourselves, and that others know us better than we do, and how it takes us much longer to develop that sense of self awareness than it does for neurotypicals. So, thank you for that comment, Tammy. Um, another strategy: uh, listen to autistic people. Right? This sounds so so basic, but in your communities right now, I guarantee you, you have amazing autistic adults who are out there who are sharing their stories who are, are writing online about the stories, the experiences that they've had. We need, you, you, this is an amazing resource that is at your disposal. Um, although I would say, bear in mind that there is a significant amount of emotional labor involved in sharing those stories. So if you are going to um, engage autistic adults, make sure to compensate them fairly for their time and their emotional labor. Um, but but just, you know, there's just so many opportunities, right? There are, there are autistic adults who are working in your schools, who are working as paras or as aides or teachers, whatever it could be. Um, so it sounds really basic, but if this was already happening, I wouldn't have to say it here. Uh, and then finally, we need to fund more research into autism and sexuality. Like I said, it's extremely difficult to get funding for research into autism and sexuality. I think it's starting to change a bit now, but historically, that's been very difficult, um, to, to get that, that, that kind of funding. And, um, so, and Abby, again, thank you for your comment about stranger danger. Like I say, um, that, you know, again, people on the spectrum are much more likely to be abused by someone we don't know, but by, excuse me, by someone we do know who has access and opportunity, but that is a very important safety skill as well, of course. Um, and, and yeah, we, and, and you speak to the fact that we can't assume that knowledge, we can't presume, right, that someone understands what could potentially occur if, if you get in a car with a stranger. So definitely, we have to be really explicit and clear when talking about these things, which I think we often don't do. We use analogies and metaphors, and we're kind of more abstract in talking about these things. And it does no good and is not, and not helpful to anybody by doing that. We have to be concrete and specific. So thank you for that comment. Um, so just a brief mention about using ABA to teach dating skills, as this is my background and my, my thesis study from, from a master's degree looked at teaching to adults on the spectrum how to ask someone out on a date. This is what I did. And I used a combination of didactic instruction, which was a written checklist, role-playing and video modeling to teach two adult men with autism level one how to ask someone out on a date. Um, 
And it took me a year just to get two participants, by the way, because big shocker, not a lot of people like to have their digging skills critiques, like who knew? Um, so I had two participants all together um, in the treatment uh, part of the study. They were in a classroom setting standing up and they were asking out a confederate of the study, an actor who was uh, taking part in the study. And then in generalization, they were in a coffee shop type setting and they were sitting down with the person. Uh, the dependent variables that I took data on at the time, this is over 10 years ago, one of them was eye contact. Were I to do this study again now, I don't think I would take data on eye contact. Um, I think that it's often can be something that is difficult for people on the spectrum, if not outright painful. So I think that were I to do this again, I would not necessarily take data on that. I took uh, data on vocal tone, um, on physical proximity, were they standing too close or too far away from the person, uh, you know, you know, respecting physical space. And I took data on a number of things that the participants were saying, because I thought that, um, I was going to have participants who, who were going to be shy and not very talkative and not know what to say. Um, in in actuality, uh, I had, like I said, I had a very hard time finding participants. All my all my classmates are doing early intervention. I didn't get along with kids when I was a kid. Let the people who are good at that do that. Um, but the participants I had were actually very talkative. Only nothing they were saying was going to get them a date in any chance in hell. Uh, and if you, I remember one of the participants in the in baseline. He said something to the, the woman uh, about her weight. And I was like, okay, game over. Like, we're done. That's it. Goodbye. You, you, you don't ever mention weight at all. Um, you know, so that was, you know, that was that was a, a big, I wish I could see you guys' faces. It's really hard to know if my jokes are landing. I sure hope they are. Um, but um, so again, I, because of the lack of change from baseline to generalization, I didn't achieve what uh, would be called experimental control, which means that I could show that was what I did from the start of the study to the end that caused the change. Um, but if you watch the videos, it was like night and day, the difference between the beginning and the end of the study. Um, and I think, you know, kind of the the biggest, uh, you know, challenge with this is that, you know, in the, within the parameters of the study, if the participants did this, this, and that, the person says, yes, I'll go out with you. In the real world, you can do everything, quote, right, and someone could still say, no, I'm not going to go out with you, because people have free will. So, um, you know, then that becomes a discussion of how can we navigate rejection? How do we help people on the spectrum deal with rejection and not perseverating on someone? Because <clears throat> it's not acceptable for a, a person to be your perseveration. You know, people can perseverate on TV shows or movies or other hobbies, but not a human being, because that's what can lead to stalking, right? So how do we, you know, and then, and, and then what's especially challenging is when we talk about teaching people on the spectrum, the rules of dating, you know, it can be frustrating to follow those rules and still not get the desired outcome. Meanwhile, Fonzie's over there breaking all the rules and he gets all the girls. And I told you my pop culture references don't go out for 1977. So there you go. Um, but uh, I'm very happy to say that as part of my work at Rutgers, uh, last year I applied for a grant, my first as a principal investigator, and I got it, a $25,000 grant to develop a sex ed curriculum for people on the spectrum called the Adult Autism and Sexuality Kit. Um, and, and I'm developing it in collaboration with Dr. Vanessa Ball, uh, who is the director of the Psychological Services Clinic in the RCAS. Um, and we, what we're doing is that we have examined seven main topic areas um, set forth in the National Sexuality Education Standards. Uh, and we're also adapting lesson plans from ANSWER, which is the oldest sex ed curriculum in the country, and it's housed at Rutgers and has been there since the 80s. So we're adapting those. And we also kind of did um, interview, in, interviews with stakeholders. Um, we, we talked with uh, mostly autistic adults, but also two parents of adults on the spectrum. And the two areas we've kind of honed in on are personal safety and healthy relationships. So we're we're looking at, at uh, healthy relationships and personal safety through the prism of sex. How do you, you know, have sex, engage in sex um, and, and in a healthy way? That's kind of because there's other curricula that currently exist. Uh, Emily Rothman at, at Boston University has the HEARTS curriculum. Uh, which kind of focuses more on relationships. And our curriculum is going to be you know, more specifically focused on sex itself, since this seems to be something that's often uh, missing. Um, and what sets this curriculum apart, kind of from what currently exists out there, is that we're hiring autistic consultants to give us feedback uh, within this. So this is not meant to be just telling people, this is how you do things in a neurotypical way. Well, no, we want to incorporate autistic communication into this curriculum and, and, and keeping that in mind for how people can achieve the goals that they have sexually whilst while being comfortable and finding what, what works best for people. Um, so this is not like an encyclopedia in the days of old. This is a living document that's informed by the population we're serving. So this is a, a foundation right now um, that we're hoping to pilot. Uh, and once we pilot it, we hope to disseminate it to 
uh, professionals in the field and then to the public. But this is just kind of a beginning step for what we hope will be built on in the, in the future. So very, very excited to be part of this um, and happy that this is something that's going to come into being. A um, couple of strategies, just really quick, for teachers and professionals. Uh, I have talked about this a bit in this presentation, but it's so important to create boundaries that people will carry over into the real world. Um, much of what I'll be covering in the Ask Curriculum centers around the concept of consent, which I could do an entire presentation on just by itself, uh, giving consent, receiving consent. We need to have more conversations about that, as well as the fact that many people on the spectrum can give or receive consent in ways besides verbally, right? Because a lot of folks on the spectrum may not communicate verbally or may have other ways of, of obtaining that consent. And so that's another piece that that, that really needs to be discussed. Um, also remembering that no is a complete sentence, like I've been saying, we have to get better at respecting the no of people on the spectrum. We're not so great at that, but it, it it's a safety skill and it's a social skill and crucially important for us to, to really keep in mind. Um, and these strategies also, I think, can really be, can work for parents as well. We have any parents here today. Um, I hope you'll take this home with you also. Uh, and again, I think we tend to, we tend to focus on what my colleague, Dr. Gerhardt, often calls a non-functional skills, right? Like useless skills. We, you know, what does it matter if somebody can name all the colors if they can't cross the street safely by themselves, right? The, the, there are things that that we learn that we take with us for the rest of our lives. And those are the things that unfortunately seem to get the least amount of focus in favor of academics and test scores and all this stuff. The life skills piece is, is what really matters. Um, okay, so thank you uh, for the check-in, Kirsten. And uh, again, just you know, we have to acknowledge the sexual needs and desires of people on the spectrum. We're not great at that. Um, if we were already doing this, I wouldn't have to say this. Like I say, sounds really basic, but we need to do that. Uh, it's important to get buy-in from all stakeholders, right? So when we're talking about getting a comprehensive and accurate sex education into the schools for people on the spectrum, getting that buy-in from parents, getting that buy-in from administrators of why it's so important. Um, and that if we had a sex ed curriculum that, that you know, factor in that life skills, factor in, you know, those those social skills pieces of sexuality, so not just biology and anatomy. You know, it's like when curb cuts were created. Curb cuts didn't just benefit people who use wheelchairs. They benefited everybody, people with mobility challenges, people who use strollers. So a comprehensive sex education curriculum that covers the social piece of sexuality would benefit everybody, not just people on the spectrum. Um, so that could help to improve buy-in. Uh, and then know what you don't know. Like I said, if you're working with with, with, a, with a team of, of others um, that are supporting someone on the spectrum, use the knowledge that uh, your other team members have. Don't feel like you have to be an expert um, in, in all of this. A um, couple of resources. So Sex Ed for Self-Advocates, this is from the Organization for Autism Research. It's free and available online. Um, it's geared toward people on the spectrum ages 15 and up, but parents can read along with it too. Professionals can read along with it. Uh, Dr. Gerhardt and I recorded the introductions to all of these sections, so you'll see us there, but it covers everything from hygiene to gender identity to dating to abuse. All of that is covered in this curriculum. And then Sexuality and Disability, a Guide for Parents. This is from Alberta Health Services in Canada. Um, it's not autism specific, but I really love this because it's sex positive and LGBTQ inclusive. Uh, I think it's a great uh, curriculum and a great starting point. Again, professionals, teachers can use this as well. And also, uh, these are some great books that are currently out there. I mentioned Dr. Hanot earlier, Asperger's Syndrome and Sexuality, uh, Making Sense of Sex by Sarah Atwood, Sexuality and Relationship Education by Davida Hartman. And then this book on the end is Gender Identity, Sexuality, and Autism. This is a collection of essays uh, written by people on the spectrum. Where possible, I encourage you to read things that are written by people on the spectrum. Uh, hopefully, my book will be among this array very soon as well. I certainly hope that it will. Um, and now there are actually some dating sites for people on the spectrum. This is certainly a new thing. Uh, Aspie Singles, Hickey, Autism Date, and Unipi. Um, I am a little shy about online dating myself because of, uh, you know, my own experiences. But these sites are not just for dating, but for friendships as well. And I believe they're all pay sites, which is to keep people safe from people who might come on the site and pretend to be on the spectrum, even though they're not. So I encourage you to do research on all of these before, uh, you know, using any of them. And kind of a final thought. Uh, for today to remember that you can't stop life from happening, right? So if you put someone in a bubble so that nothing will ever happen to them, nothing will ever happen to them. But that's not how you help people on the spectrum stay safe uh, and make the same choices as our neurotypical peers. And I love this quote from Frida Kahlo, al final del día podemos soportar más de lo que creemos, which means at the end of the day, we endure far more than we think we can. 
And to me, this applies to people on the spectrum because we are resilient because we are forced to be resilient um, because we are living in a world that's not built for people like us. And we're trying to thrive and succeed against every single odd and every single obstacle. But if you teach us about sexuality, you will not harm our innocence. You will not, um, you know, be, be encouraging us to have sex. You'll be giving us the information that we need to be empowered, to, to navigate our sexuality, to find out about what we enjoy in terms of pleasure and what we can do to keep ourselves safe uh, in this world long after you're no longer here. So here's my contact information. I know some people have been asking. Um, I'll keep this up and we can, we can go to questions. Um, so I see the chat is starting to fill with questions. Um, yeah. yeah. So I've been monitoring them. It might be just quicker and easier if I kind of facilitate them. Um, Absolutely. So first of all, we've gotten like a million thank yous to you, Amy, for your presentation and like people saying that you're so funny and they love how real and transparent you are. Uh, thank you. I will, I will save the chat for you so you, I can send it to you and you can read some of these comments because they're really, really great. Okay. Um, some of the questions, so we had one question in the Q&A, is there a theory that autistic people may struggle to understand their sexual identity due to social challenges and finding connections. For example, autistic people may be identifying as they, them, they are interested in being in a relationship. Uh, is there a theory? Oh, I see it here, okay. Yeah, is there a theory in um, people in the Q and A? Well, I, I think that, I mean, we're, we're kind of conflating two things here because we're talking about gender identity versus sexuality. So they're not the same thing, right? So someone, you know, navigating their sexual, their, their, their gender identity is not the same as necessarily navigating one's um, uh, gen, uh, sexual orientation. And I think that those things can happen either, they can happen around the same time and they can happen, you know, vastly apart. Like someone can know from an early age that they're non-binary or trans um, it's not something that anybody tells you or influences you to be. It's part of who you are. But people may, the, the thing with autistic folks is that a lot of times we don't have the vocabulary to describe these things, right? Because of not receiving sex education, not receiving this information, it, it becomes jumbled and convoluted because of not having access to, to the language that is needed to describe what, what one is feeling. So um, the social challenges are, are a piece of that, right? The autism is a piece of that. But the other piece is from society, is from Society not enabling people to have that information to be able to make those 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 you know those decisions about one's identity and to be able to explain and describe those things. However, it does not mean that the person isn't feeling those things. It just may be that they can't specifically label them in that moment. So, um, again, I think just we're talking about two kind of separate things here: that that the gender identity versus you know sexual orientation. Those are the not they're not they're not mutually exclusive. I think that I always get that mixed up whether it's mutually exclusive or not mutually exclusive, but yeah. So I think, yeah, there's a lot of pieces that are, that are involved with that. So thank you for asking that. Okay. Um, so the next question, is there a way to, uh, oh yes, we will have a way for you to connect with Amy. She has that up on the slide now. Um, I don't see any other questions in the Q&A. A lot of you are asking if this is being recorded, where do you find the recording, where's the presentation, et cetera. All of those uh, questions about the presentation and the recording will be up on our website. Um, and I can post that in the chat for you. And you can find it there in about 48 working business hours. So on Friday morning, roughly. Um, the link to our website will also be in your follow-up email. So if you don't have time to save the link, it's going to be in your follow-up email, which you will receive on Friday morning. But here is the website where the recording will be and all of our other recordings. Amy did a past presentation for us as well. Um, and her presentation is on that website as well, her past one, which I... And blanking on the title of it, Amy, do you remember? Uh, yes, that was uh, Freshman Disorientation, Navigating College on the Autism Spectrum. Okay, yes. So that was on February 8th. And it is on that website too, if you want to go back and watch that recording of Amy's presentation on that topic. Um, and it is 1130. So we want to be respectful of your time. So if you do need to log off, feel free to, but we'll stay on for a couple more minutes for a couple more questions. Um, a lot of people are saying that they really appreciate how open you're being. 
Oh, it's my pleasure. So I, I see an interesting uh, comment in the chat. Um, the obstacle I'm facing is students who are not on the spectrum, understanding that students who are have the same feelings of sexuality as they are. And that's interesting. I, I mean, I've often found that a lot of that comes more from the parents than from the students. So I think you might find that with the neurotypical students, a lot of this, a lot of those attitudes come down from parents, right? It's it's the reason why I think I was bullied so badly in school is that the the girls who bullied me, it was mostly girls, the one in particular, her parent, her mother was horrific. And her mother would say horrible things about me and said, I need to be institutionalized and this and that. And so that that ignorance, you know, it's it really comes down to just lack of knowledge. I feel like we we need to be really educating everybody more about autism, parents and students alike. Um, that's part of the work I do as well. I do uh, presentations, I do assemblies for schools, for students, for parents. And, and it's, you know, I, I really think that's something that's taught. I don't think kids come into it being, you know, hateful or afraid. It's something that is kind of taught by the world around us. So if we if we can, you know, address that like earlier on, I think that that would really help so much. Um, and I appreciate you asking that question and making that comment. So thank you. Yeah, we have a lot of comments and just like sharing of stories and stuff, which is great. I'm loving the dialogue. If you would like to yeah. ask a question or share a story live, you can feel free to raise your hand and I can unmute you. Oh, and then I did go ahead and put the link to the follow-up survey in the chat. If you have a moment to take it, we would appreciate your feedback. The same follow-up survey link will be in your uh, follow-up email too. So I see Dr. Otis Taylor, you can't open the link, but um, you should be able to hopefully in the follow-up email, or you might try copy and pasting it into your browser and that might work. But we would love your feedback on this session. So please take a minute to fill that follow-up survey out. Oh, okay. We have a couple people who raised their hand, Amy, if you have a couple more minutes to stay on with us. Sure. Okay, so Jacqueline, I'm gonna allow you to talk if you would like to. Hi, Amy, thanks uh, for joining us today. It was a really powerful message and I appreciate your vulnerability and courage to, to share your story, so thank you. Um, my question is, I'm a, a district administrator who's overseeing our uh, middle school programming. We're really excited to open and launch next year. We are developing a life skills curriculum um, but also recognizing that our that our students are reaching age of puberty and um, you know a lot of your topics today um, felt for me and maybe I need to educate myself more more geared towards high school so do you have any um, suggestions or resources just kind of for the younger kids you know our middle school is six seven eight but these topics are going to come up and I want to make sure that we're prepared to support our kids. Well, absolutely. That that's that's a great question. Um, like I said, my work has been more with young adults and adults because there is such a lack of services and supports for that population. I know. I think there are some things out there. Um, the, that OAR guide I mentioned, the Organization for Autism Research, that like I said, is for fifteen and up. But I think you you can probably. I mean, I'd say, um, some of it could be you know geared toward toward younger potentially. Um, I oh, let me think. Yeah, I, I there, uh, there's like there's a book about uh, puberty. I think um, it's oh god, I can't. The name is totally escaping me. But there's like one for boys and one for girls that is for like young younger kids. Um, it's again, it's just not really my wheelhouse because yeah. you know there's, there's such a lack of of this. Um, and I saw somebody in the chat asked about for folks uh, who have higher support needs, people uh, who have, you know are, are have more challenges um, or intellectual disability, and there are resources like. As well, I, I would refer you to my colleague, Dr. Bobby Gallagher. Um, she is amazing. She works with individuals on the spectrum with higher support needs, with intellectual disability in the area of sexuality. Um, so, I, if you reach out to me, I can I can give you Bobby's email uh, if if you have questions. Um, but yeah, I'm I just uh, I I don't typically you know work with like the the younger younger kids, so that's not specifically my wheelhouse there. No, that's okay. Thank you very much. Um, and even just some of those resources will be good just to, to as a starting base to scaffold from. So thank you. You're welcome. Absolutely. We all need a starting point, right? We all have to start somewhere. So, oh, thank you, Abby. Abby made a suggestion in the chat there, puberty periods and all that stuff. That's great. Yes. I, I know there are others. I, it's just hard for me to remember them off the top of my head, but if you reach out to me, I, I can try to, to find those others and, and, and get those to you. 
Okay, so I'm going to allow Shelly to talk next. Um, somebody said something about CPDUs. So you can email us um, our center and we can provide a certificate for you. I will um, put that email in the chat, but Shelly, I'm going to allow you to talk. Hi, Amy. You Hi. rock. This is this has been outstanding. I just got to say, I've really enjoyed this. I mean, for a summer day and have to be here, I want to be here. It's not a have oh, to. Thank you. Let me tell you. Um, so here's my conundrum, and and I'm just looking for resources. I'm in a, I'm in a situation where I, I have a number of students on the spectrum, and I, I I see your presentation in them so often. And I love them to death. Um, there's a push for certain students when they reach that sexually active age where their curiosities are creating what's considered what neurotypical people would consider inappropriate behavior. And I understand that there's a learning process occurring for my individuals on the spectrum and I wanna work with them. But the first go-to as a SPED teacher that I'm finding from those that are above me is, oh, this is inappropriate. We, they're victimizing all the other people. We need to send them off to a, a, a different school. I'm a really big proponent of keeping that inclusion piece there because they're going to get the best possible behavior modeling in most cases in an inclusion setting as opposed to a group other. Yeah. What sorts of research or resources could I use when building a uh, best practices evidence-based argument against that? Um, I, that, that, that's a great question. I, I don't know exactly what research is out there on that. I mean, I, I think there must be. Um, but the problem is there's so little research in the area of sexuality to begin with that I'm not sure that there actually is research about, um, you know, because sex ed is, is, is so frequently not all for two people on the spectrum. I don't know that there would be anything about it, it being uh, in an inclusive setting versus uh, self-contained. But I, I think, I mean, you could extrapolate from the research that shows the benefits of inclusion uh, classrooms versus self-contained just for general education. I think you could certainly extrapolate there that, um, you know, it's tricky in this area because obviously we want to keep people's safety in mind. We don't want anybody to be potentially harmed or any way or, you know, uh, but that can happen from either side. It can be that the Absolutely. autistic individual, yeah, right, could, could be, a, ooh, excuse me, it could be harmed or victimized by the neurotypical students as, as much as the other way around. So, but it goes back to what I was saying about how I think a comprehensive, a comprehensive sex education that covers the social skill piece would benefit everybody. It wouldn't just be for, for folks on the spectrum. And um, I mean, you know, obviously if somebody is exhibiting potentially dangerous or harmful behaviors, you probably wouldn't want them to be in that inclusion setting if they're going to be potentially harming someone or themselves, like in the immediate uh, moment. Um, but, you know, you also don't... <sighs> It's so tricky. Um, I think, it is. yeah, you know, we, we, we don't want to necessarily single out autistic people and say like this person is is a predator because they're autistic. Well, no, it's they're, 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 the, the, the danger is not because of the autism. It's because of the lack of knowledge, really. Right. So yes. it's it's that that's I think what we need to emphasize is like explaining to administrators and whoever that the, the, the danger isn't because this person's autistic. It's not because of their disability. It's because they don't have this information so they can't make safe and smart choices. So that's, you know, I mean, it's a whole other conversation we're having if somebody does have the knowledge and still continues you know, to make bad choices or potentially harmful choices. But that's a whole other thing, right? And, and more often than not, we see that with neurotypicals. I feel like neurotypicals who do know better, who do have that information and still, you know, cause harm to people on the spectrum and over. Um, but but ultimately, but yeah, kind of making that distinction that you know, it, it, you know, if you if you say this person should be sent away, the other the other message is that only people who are autistic are the ones who do this type of thing. But really, anybody can be doing these things. They're, they're, these behaviors can occur from neurotypicals. And would we? How would we address it? How would you say to someone? How would we address this? If this was a neurotypical student, what would you do if this student was Absolutely. neurotypical? Yeah. Absolutely, we got. High school students, you see them kissing, you know, and, you know, various levels of PDA just naturally in a high school setting. And I'm very sure that those visual modeling is where some of my uh, young ones are picking this up. They're just missing that consent piece. Right. Thank you. You're welcome.
Okay, so I have one more person. It looks like Cordell. I'm gonna allow you to talk. I, I see uh, Nadia has her hand up as well. Oh, okay. So um, Cordell and Nadia, you both have the ability to unmute yourself, but it looks, if Cordell, if you wanna speak first. Or, or Nadia, you might want, if you could speak, Nadia. Cordell, it looks like your microphone isn't connected. And I just wanted to say again, um, maybe Nadia and Cordell, while you're kind of mm -hmm. figuring that out, um, for CPDUs, you can email um, icsps at ilstu.edu. I put that email in the chat, the website, and we're, we'll have the recording and the presentation and everything. We are like 11 minutes over the designated time for this webinar. So just want to make sure that everybody's aware of that. You definitely do not have to stay on. Um, want to be mindful of your time, but also want to take the time to answer your questions. So. Um, Nadia, I am asking you to unmute, so I'm not sure if you can do that. If you're unable to unmute, you might want to just ask your questions in the chat, Nadia and Cordell. I apologize for that. Or maybe you can reach out to Amy mm. via her contact information um, following the webinar. Yes, ICSPS at ILSTU.edu. Yes, David, that's correct. For CPUs, CPDUs, you can just email us. We can't provide, we provide a certificate of participation. That's what we provide. And well, then I'll put Cordell's question in, in Q&A here. Oh, okay. uh, sexual education is addressed in fifth, eighth, and ninth, 10th grade through health. Do you know of any states that require health for every student from eighth to 12th grade? I don't, I mean, not that I'm aware of. I think that's part of the problem, Cordell, is that it's so inconsistent. Uh, throughout the country, there's no federal like requirement for sex education in every state. It's kind of left up to the individual states, which means that um, it's wildly inconsistent. And, I, and, and, and as a matter of fact, in every state, what's taught isn't, isn't even required to be medically accurate. So imagine, you know, how horrible that is, that not only is, is, it, is there not consistent sex education in every state, but it's not even medically accurate in all cases. Um, so yeah, regrettably, that's, I, I think, to my knowledge, that's the current situation, unfortunately. And we have one more question in the chat from Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, how can I access these relevant sexuality resources to educate children and to educate parents and grandparents? Um, well, so I, if, I'll be sending the slides to Kirsten and all the links will be in, in, in there. Um, I believe, or I could send the links kind of, I, if I, well, if I said, yeah, they should be, you should be able to click on them, I think from a PDF, I think, um, but yeah. if you can't, you know, so yeah. Yes, they should be able to. Yeah. yeah. So we are about 15 minutes over time. So I'm going to go ahead and close this out. I want to be respectful of Amy's time too. I really appreciate you, Amy, staying on for, you know, 15 more minutes to answer questions. I wanted to make sure no we got all your comments in, but I, you know, this is such a robust, great topic and we've been just been had amazing turnout and participation. So I also wanted mm. people to be able to get, be able to converse with you as well. Um, you can definitely reach out to Amy via her contact information. It's in her slide deck. Um, we will have that slide deck and recording sent out to you in your follow-up email. It's on our website. It'll be up there within about 48 working hours. So about Friday morning, be on the lookout for that. Um, and we just thank you so much for attending today and your participation. We really appreciate it. We're so thank glad you. that this topic was so well received to the field. Um, and thank you so much. Be sure to take our follow-up survey. It is in the chat. And then also um, it will be on your follow-up email too, the follow-up survey. So be sure to take that and let us know um, how you liked the session and we appreciate it. And everyone have a great rest of your Wednesday. Thank you so much, Amy. Thank you, Kirsten. My pleasure. Thanks everybody for coming. Really appreciate it.